Seven months ago, he was an unknown four-star general. Today, 56-year-old General H. Norman Schwarzkopf needs no introduction. And so we present an in-depth interview without a lengthy introduction. Our conversation took place four days ago in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The only thing you have to know, and you'll see why, is that this commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in the Persian Gulf likes to be called the bear. And he doesn't care if it's a teddy bear or, as the enemy now knows, a grizzly bear. General, are these men are with you all the time? They're with me 24 hours a day. He's guarded day and night, even in his own headquarters. We're several stories underground. The location is secret. Security is a joint responsibility, Americans and Saudis. The American members of the team have rotated, but the Saudi members of the team have been with me for seven months now. And they take very, very good care of me. He lives and works in this underground cloister. During the war, he told me, he rarely saw daylight. His most intense work was done at the end of this hallway, where security was at its tightest. This is the war. And this is the war room. This is where it all happened. This is the first time General Schwarzkopf has allowed a camera crew to tour his war room. I would sit in that chair right there. Bob Johnson's the chief of staff. Bird is the director of operations. And then what you have is back all around the back wall over there, all the various staff directorates who would be here, and there would be a representative from all of them here at any given time. What you have up here is uh, we would generally have uh, three or four different maps. So one map is the ground operations. What's so this? This is the location of all the friendly forces. So we'd have the location of all the friendly troops where they were located. Over here would generally be the intelligence map where we'd have the location of all the enemy forces. And this constantly changes. You sit here in front of you, and as the situation changes, it's posted. Red That's phone for the president? Red phone, well, the red phone, normally for Colin Powell, but I can oh. talk hotline to Colin Powell, hotline Secretary of Defense, or for that matter, hotline to the White House if I need to. Did you talk to the president often? Uh, no, not often. Uh, he uh, called me, I've talked to him, I guess, three times since I've been over here. How often did you talk to Colin Powell? Every single day. At least, I, I, I would say at least once a day, but sometimes it was three and four and five times a day. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is a tactical radio system, and on this radio system, I could talk down, right down to the tactical commanders in the field if need be. Who is this little fellow? That's a bear. That's, well, that's a baby that grizzly bear. Out. He's, that's a baby he grizzly lives bear. here? He, he lives here. This has been his spot since the... Uh, he took up that position on the day that we started the, uh, the uh, strategic bombing campaign and has never left that spot since. This was a gift to me uh, from my sister for Christmas. Would you like to see him work? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the way you sound, General, when you're really giving orders? Any resemblance is purely coincidental. I want you to know that. That's... I should ask you, is that the way he sounds? Just as he says. <laughs> be, be careful how you answer that, Bert. <laughs> Remember, you could be over here a long time, Bert, right? <laughs> Norman Schwarzkopf not only talks tough, he is. Tough as nails, say those who work with him. But I discovered a vulnerable side, too, to this veteran soldier. When we sat down to talk, my very first question evoked an emotional response. General, you have two daughters and a young son. What did you say to your 13-year-old son when you left to come here and begin a war? I got the family together. Uh, they, they didn't have any idea I'd be leaving as soon as I would. As a matter of fact, I think they really thought, uh, because, I, because Central Command has been run from, from Tampa, Florida, I think that in their minds, they thought that I was going to be running this whole thing from Florida. So they had, they didn't really know when I was going to be leaving. But a couple of days before it was time to leave, I got the whole family together. And I just told them that what was going to happen. I told them it was my job. Uh, that I was proud to be doing it. I wanted them to understand why. And I wanted them to be proud of me for doing it. And that was it. You miss them a lot, I can tell. Yeah. yeah, I do. Take me back the first night, the first night that our bombs were sent uh, to Baghdad. Where were you? What were you doing? What were you feeling? We, of course, knew what time the first shots would be fired, 20 minutes to 3 in the morning. Um, knew exactly who was going to fire them. And so I assembled the staff downstairs at 2.30 in the morning in the war room. Chaplain was there. Uh, had the chaplain say a little prayer. 
uh, for the protection of our, uh, our servicemen and women. And then we played uh, Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. And uh, we did. Anybody who knows me knows that I love that song. Uh, but that was sort of what it was all about. And, and, then, and then we just said, okay, now let's go to work. And uh, at 20 minutes to 3, uh, we got the reports that the first shots had been fired, and uh, that started it. I know this is a strange question to ask a general, but were you ever scared? Sure. When most? I've, I've been scared in every war I've ever been in. What was Saddam Hussein's biggest mistake? His predictability. His predictability? His I always predict thought he was so unpredictable. Everybody nah. says we don't know him, we don't know what makes him do things. We, we studied the Iran-Iraq campaigns very, very carefully. And, and uh, based upon the Iran-Iraq campaigns, we came up with a lot of assumptions of what they would do. And we weren't wrong a single time. By the way, General, what do you think is going to happen to those Iraqi planes in Iran? I think they're going to stay there. So if uh, Saddam Hussein is as predictable as you said, uh, why did Saddam Hussein send those planes to Iran? Well, I don't think he did. Okay. I, I, my, my, um, my feeling is that he, he they went to Iran and, and got a, a gentleman's agreement for what that's worth uh, to send their commercial airplanes over there. So their commercial airplanes all flew over to Iran and were safe. I think the first group of pilots that went over there uh, with their military aircraft recognized very quickly that uh, that they were take off and, and die uh, if they fought us and therefore they uh, said well gee if these other airplanes are going over there we can scoot on over there also I think that's probably what started the floodgates open uh, and they're gonna stay there I don't think there's any question about that general how do you feel about the the uh American armchair television analysts who fought the war for us every day with maps truth <laughs> uh, most of them most of them were a joke most of them uh, and, and I and I and a lot of them are my friends so I, I don't want to give the wrong impression but but uh, you know some of the analysis that uh, you heard was ludicrous they didn't know what was going on they didn't have the facts at hand um, and uh, and they were talking about stuff that uh, it didn't make any sense. Uh, uh, some of them I resented. I resented the fact that, uh, that they had served in our military and received military training for, for, for a great number of years. And then they were using that military training to guess openly uh, on television uh, what I was going to do, what we were going to do over here on a program that they knew very well was being monitored by the enemy. Uh, I, I, I find that that's difficult for me to reconcile in my sense of values, uh, why anyone would do that. There were some that were very good, and I don't want to get into names, OK? But there were some that I thought uh, were very helpful in their analysis. Uh, they were careful to, to, I think, explain to the American public what was going on, but they were not they were not going beyond that point to predict what was going to happen or to predict the reasons why, so on and so forth. When in the middle of the war you looked up on your television screen and you saw Peter Arnett at CNN and other reporters in, in Baghdad, tell me how you felt. Was that helpful? Was that harmful? Did it bother you? It's something that's still a matter of controversy in our country. When Peter Arnett first started making his broadcast from Baghdad, it didn't bother me a bit. Subsequently, there was a lot of resentment uh, on the part in dress uniforms with shoulder, you know, boards on and their ribbons and all this sort of business. And, and they got out and I was standing there like this. And, uh, and your I... Sunday best. Yeah, my Sunday best. I mean, uh, this... Uh, you were clean? I mean, <laughs> clean, come on, yeah. I'd showered the night before. Right. Right? But, uh, but the, uh, I, had a, I had a young American interpreter who went to the general and we'd already decided that everyone who went in that tent would be searched electronically and the general didn't think too much of that idea and uh, and uh, then uh, I told the Air Force Major to tell him well that's all right but that's what was going to happen anyhow and that I would be the first one to be searched and he immediately looked at me and said well the only person that's going to search me is my counterpart and we said who what do you mean by your counterpart and he said the person that's going to negotiate and I said 
I'm the person that's going to negotiate. And the guy, he, he, he kind of looked down at my boots, and then he looked up and up at me again, and he looked down, and he said, well, who are you? And I said, I said I'm General Schwarzkopf. And this transpired, and he said, oh, all right. He hadn't even seen your picture. I, I, I don't know whether he'd seen my You're picture. You're not famous not, in, in Baghdad. Apparently, I'm not famous in Baghdad. But that did, I mean, it was just sort of funny that I think that, I think that he didn't expect the guy to be out there and in the same uniform that all the rest of the troops were in, uh, to be the person that was going to be negotiating, or, or not negotiating, but discussing with him. I understand that the one place that they were surprised was when you gave them the number of the Iraqi POWs. They had said, we are now ready to give you the numbers. And, and we said, fine. And he said, we have 41 POWs. And he gave us a breakdown by country. And he interrupted me. And he said, uh, would you mind telling us how many prisoners you have? And I said, uh, well, as of last night, we had 60,000, but we're still counting. And, and you, the entire delegation, you could just see a, a, there was a sense of, of, of you know, they, they all kept a poker face, but you could tell that every one of them just immediately tensed. Do you think that they knew then that they really were defeated when Saddam Hussein was still saying, this is a glorious war, we have fought valiantly, we have won? I mean, did it sink in? Very early on, they they tried to say that they were withdrawing, you know, that they had voluntarily withdrawn. And I, but I wasn't about to accept that at that point. I just said, you know, um, I just said, uh, you know, we could probably argue from now until sunset is whether or not uh, what you were doing was withdrawing. And then therefore, and we're not here to discuss that. We're here to discuss the arrangements that will make sure that we continue to seize the offensive. So let's get on with that. And you know, I don't want to discuss that. If you could meet Saddam Hussein, what would you ask him or say to him. Get out of town. The men and women of Desert Storm are beginning to come home. When will General Schwarzkopf be returning? Well, not for at least another month, he told us. He said he still has troops in the field. The general who served two tours in Vietnam is a four-star general. In American history, only five men have become five-star generals. Home for the general these days is a small, cramped room that contains a bed and a desk separated by a screen, and that's about it. It didn't take us very long for this private tour. So here is part two of our interview with the general. This is, this is home sweet home for the last this, two months. This palatial teeny-weeny room? This is it. This room was bare when we started, except for the maps and the desk and the furniture, of course, and everything in there, you see, has been something that someone has sent me. Why a camouflage cover in the bed? My entire first tour in Vietnam, I spent wrapped up in one of these. That's called a poncho liner. I don't like to sleep with a heavy quilt, and so I had the poncho liner, and we threw it on, and it's just sort of been there ever since. How much sleep did you get on an average in this bed? Some nights, four hours a night uh, downtime, and, uh, and some nights, uh, you know, you might be lucky and get five or six, but m most of the time it was about four hours, really. This is a piece of Iraq. Iraq itself? Iraq itself. Someone sent it to you? Yeah, this, this unit, I, was, I visited this unit the other day, and they brought this out with them on the 4th of March when hmm. they came out, and they wanted me to have a piece of Iraq. So, that's, <laughs> so now you uh, do. So now I have a piece of Iraq. That entire box of tapes was sent by someone who found I like classical music, hmm. and they recorded all their favorite tapes and sent them to me. It's, it's really been, it really has been wonderful. Hmm. I, get about, I get about 150 letters a day. Do you answer them? Oh, every one. Now you're going to get more. So. Is it true that you're getting romantic proposals? I've had a few. Oh, I see. You don't want to, you don't want to discuss them? <laughs> you want Brenda maybe one? No, I don't think Brenda has anything to worry about. I, I don't see. think Brenda has anything to worry about. And these two beauties are your daughters? This is Cindy and Jessica. They are really beautiful girls, aren't well, they? Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, that's Christian. Christian. Your dad? You know, he passed away in 1958. Your father was a major general. Mm. Do you think about him at all now? Yeah, I probably, I probably thought about him more since I've been over here than I, than I have in many, many years. I mean, many times I've just thought that, you know, if he was looking at me now, you know, I, I knew he'd be proud. You know, there are certain questions I ask you, like about your father, and the tears come to your eyes. I didn't know it showed. The old picture of generals. Generals don't cry. Generals don't get tears in their eyes. Sure they do. They just didn't admit it? Oh, I think they admitted it. Uh, Grant, after Shiloh, went back and cried. 
Uh, Sherman went back and cried. I mean, these, the, and these are the tough old guys. Lee cried uh, at the loss of human life, at, at the, uh, uh, the pressures that were brought to bear. Uh, Lincoln cried. Uh, I don't think, and, and, and frankly, any man that doesn't cry scares me a little bit. I, I don't think I would like a man who was incapable of, 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 of enough emotion to, to get tears in his eyes every now and then. I, that, that type of person scares me. That's not a human being. Why do you dislike being called Storm and Norman? Storm and Norman tends to portray someone who just goes around and raises hell all the time and just, just kicks everybody around and has no sensitivity at all. And, and, and I think that's why I don't like it. I, I, I know that's why I don't like it. I, I have a temper. I, I will freely admit to that. I'm not proud of it. Uh, I don't like myself when I lose my temper. But I, I wear my heart squarely on my sleeve. I believe I owe it to everyone to let them know when I don't like something. Uh, but I don't carry a grudge. I do not browbeat my staff. I do not drive people into the ground. I, I'm not a total martinet. I, I'm a human being, and I and Storm and Norman portrays something that's 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 you know somebody that's mad all the time and raising hell all the time, and that's that's not me. Do you think we should have compulsory military service? I think we should have compulsory national service. I think that. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to be an American. We should all want to do something for the privilege of, of being able to call ourselves American. And I'm not saying it has to be in the military. There's, you know, there's the environment, there's the national parks, there's the hospitals, there's a thousand different ways all of us can do something. General, there's probably not one soldier who came back from Vietnam the same as he went. And you have talked in the past about Vietnam. How did Vietnam change you? I was probably a lot more happy-go-lucky before Vietnam and after. And that's because, because I came to understand that, that, uh, that carelessness and negligence and, and lousy leadership and, and uh, and self-serving uh, officers and generals cost human lives, and and you just can't forgive that. You can't, you cannot forgive that sort of crassness. Um, people who are more more concerned with their ambition than they are with their troops it is unforgivable to me. And and I, and, and uh, you know, and again, I, I. I you're supposed to be able to forgive everything. I can't forgive that. I cannot forgive that. You said recently in an interview that you were forced to lie about the number of casualties in Vietnam. Sure. Is this why you have been careful or been unable to give the number of casualties in this war because you don't want to, I don't know what, make that kind of mistake or give that kind of misinformation? Yeah. Barbara, there was a terrible erosion and in integrity in the armed forces during Vietnam. I don't think that many of us came out of out of um, out of uh, Vietnam and could hold our heads up and say, "Our my sense of integrity is still lily white and pure," because we all know that we had lied about body count. We all knew that there had been a lot of other lies, uh, and it did it did bad things to the officer corps. But it's a different officer corps today. It's an officer corps that has learned from that experience. But when we went into this thing, I was bound and determined that we were going to tell it like it was. Absolutely tell it like it was. General, you came home from Vietnam after the second tour, and you said people spit at you. Oh, no. Nobody ever spit at me. Oh. And I can assure you, had they, there would have been an immediate reckoning, but they did spit at a lot of people in military uniform. Okay. Excuse me, but I just... No, I'm glad you cleared it up. Nobody, nobody was going to spit at me. No. Nobody. Now I'm seeing the temper. <laughs> no, now no, I, I just... Uh, that, that, okay, uh, but you yeah. know what I'm getting at. Sure. Okay.
after Vietnam, did you ever think of resigning from the Army? Oh, yeah. Sure. I've thought about resigning from the Army before Vietnam a lot of times, too. Why didn't you quit after Vietnam? There were a lot of things that needed to be fixed. And if you quit and ran away from it, then, yeah. then you know, you're, you're, that's not the time to quit. Not when everything's broken. The time to quit is when everything's fixed. Oh, boy, what an opening. <laughs> when you go home, first of all, do you have any idea what people think of you at home? You're going to come home such a hero. I, uh, um, but I'm not a hero. And, and, and that's important. It's important to me. The, the, tr the, the people... I've said this before, and I, and I don't want to keep repeating myself. It doesn't take a hero to order men into battle. It takes a hero to be one of those men that goes into battle, and, 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 and that, those are the people that are the heroes. Those are the people that should receive the adulation. Well, I, let's hope they do as well. You're going to have a lot of choices. Now, if you had your druthers, would you really like to retire? Because this summer, supposedly, you're 35 years or up, and you could retire. I plan for a long time to retire uh, this summer. I've been at this business for 39 years. You know what I really, really want to do? Yeah. There's bound to be a great cause out there that can use a tired old retread general to serve it. To ser you know, there's bound to be a cause, whether it's the, you know, the conservation, the environment, uh, the wildlife. Uh, uh, I'm, a great, I'm a great believer in, in uh, educational exchange. Young people so from like one country. So you'd like to be country. the head of a big organization, non-profit organization? Well, it doesn't have to be big. Little non-profit organization. <laughs> You're not going to uh, make a lot of money doing that. Well, I would. Yeah, I've got three kids to put through college. I wouldn't mind making a little money, too. You, believe me, you don't get rich in the Army. I can assure you that. Would it mean a great deal to be a five-star general, should that happen? I can't even begin to visualize myself as a five-star general. I, when I think of the people who are five-star generals, I can't even see myself standing in their shadow. And I mean that very seriously. Uh, oh, it, it, you know, it would be a, it would be a magnificent honor. I mean, it would be a, a, an honor that that I mean that that surpasses anyone's dreams. But uh, but I don't see it. I, I really don't. Are you a Republican or a Democrat, sir? I'm an independent. I've either, always been either side can draft you. No, no, that may be neither side can draft me. Maybe <laughs> that was a, maybe that's. A, Florida would, uh, has been talking, or people in Florida have been talking about the possibility of your running for the Senate. You could serve that way. That would be a, a way of continuing service to the country. I'm serious now. Would you think of that? I'm not too sure I'm cut out to be a politician. And I'd rather not get into all the, the, the you know, uh, but I can't say never, okay. I mean, if I, if, if there were some, again, if there was a calling, but, but I certainly, uh, right, right now, yeah. I, don't, I don't know where to go from here except to say that right now I have absolutely no political uh, ambition at all. General, you've talked to your troops here. Would you like to say something to the families at home about these men and women? Well, let me say something about the families. The, the, the military family is just as much of a hero as the troops are. And, and people don't realize it, but in order to, in order to, if, if you love a soldier, if you love a sailor, if you love a Marine, if you love an airman, you're going to sacrifice a lot. People don't realize how much they sacrifice. So all, all I want to say to the families is thanks for loving us. In the history of 2020, we've never had the kind of reaction that followed last week's appearance by General Norman Schwarzkopf. Barbara had gone to Saudi Arabia to talk with the commander of the Allied forces in the Persian Gulf, and the interview was both personally revealing and it provided new details about how the war was waged. Well, time constraints limited how much could be shown, so tonight 
an encore, actually more of that same interview. I have to ask you if you were surprised by the response. Yes, I was, truthfully. I, I think we, the response was so great and we didn't expect it uh, to be that much. He's a very popular man. Well, if you saw last week's interview, we should tell you that everything in tonight's conversation is new. And if you missed last week, this will give you some idea of what the general is all about. The only thing we are going to repeat is a bit of this charming scene, which caused a lot of comment. Who is this little fellow? That's a bear. That's the, well, that's the baby I grizzly I bear. He's, that's the baby he grizzly lives bear. here? He, he lives here. That's Many of you were spot. curious about how the general got his nickname of the bear. Well, last week he told us how he disliked his other nickname of Storm and Norman. Here's the story behind the bear. Uh, the bear was, the bear came long before Storm and Norman. The bear was a nickname that was given to me by my troops. Uh, I think it first started in, in, in Vietnam and, and it, uh, it very much grew when I commanded a brigade in Alaska. You know, there were bears all over Alaska and that sort of thing. And, 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 that, and I think that that, that was, I, I think probably maybe probably the truth of the matter is I think the bear was given to me as a term of affection and Storm and Norman probably was given as by one, by a detractor. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I don't like it. And it's know. caught on. But, but you're a, um, you're not a grizzly bear. <laughs> you're, and you're not a teddy bear. Well, well, sometimes I'm a teddy bear, and sometimes I'm a grizzly bear, and sometimes I'm a polar bear, and sometimes <laughs> I'm a panda bear, and sometimes I'm a koala bear, and you know, okay. it's just, a, oh, just, like, for? just like anybody else. I'm, you know, you're, you're not, and nobody's the same all the time. General, what was the toughest military decision that you had to make, if there was one? I, I think probably. Uh, when I uh, when I told uh, Secretary Cheney and General Powell that we were ready to go on the offensive, and and, and that's that's a tough decision to make. A according to all the classic uh, theories that are out there today on uh, on the formulas, all the operations research systems analysts uh, formulas, we should still be sitting in Saudi Arabia and never have attacked. Uh, that's right, absolutely. Because Why? when you looked at the number of tanks that he had versus the number of tanks we had, the number of troops he had versus the number of troops we the had. Size of the desert. Et cetera, the size of the desert, distances, the logistics challenge and everything else. All of those things, when you put them in the formula, would come out and say, you're crazy if you attack. Ah! Any military man worth his salt doesn't want to go to war because he knows that going to war is going to kill people. And, and certainly going to kill his own troops. So, so e the entire time you're doing the planning, you have this, this desire to put together a superb plan, a plan that will succeed, a plan that will minimize casualties. But at the same time, in the back of your mind, you're hoping the whole time you don't have to do it. And you want desperately to measure up. Uh, you want desperately to have the strength to do the job that you have to do. Did you measure up? I, I hope so. After last week's interview, many viewers said they were surprised when General Schwarzkopf admitted to crying occasionally. In fact, he told me, sometimes he has to fight the impulse. Do you ever cry in front of your troops? Hmm. I try not to. I don't. I, I really don't. As a matter of fact, when I'm in front of the troops, uh, most of the time I think that... Uh, I, I, I guess I really think that, uh, you know, when I'm with them, they don't want, uh, they don't want a general to cry. Uh, and, and that's very important to me, and so therefore I don't. Christmas Eve was tough, but Christmas Eve, I went out to a Christmas Eve service, and, and I, um, I was going to take a place way in the back so nobody could see me. So, so if I did get overcome with emotion, you know, that, they, uh, uh, that, that, that it would be just me. And I walked into the tent and, and, uh, where, the, where the service was being held, and the, they, they found out that I was coming. And of course, there was a seat reserved absolutely right square in the <laughs> middle of the tent under all the lights in the front row. And, uh, I, uh, and so I just had to control it. But because the troops were there and because, because I ordered the troops not to do that, then I didn't. And I, so, so it was a blessing that I was in the very front row <laughs> in front of everyone. And where everyone in a big U-shaped group where everybody could look right yeah. at me. I, I would like to ask, and I, and I grant you that I'm asking it for um, specific reasons, but I would like you to say something about the women in this war. 
I'm really asking with great seriousness because yeah, this is the first yeah, time we've had women well, uh, uh, f uh, involved the way they are. I think it's a wonderful question. You know, the, the, the percentage of women in the United States Army is about 12 and half percent. And they are absolutely indispensable. They did a magnificent job out there. There were all sorts of jobs that were done by women. I mean, look at this, this magnificent young woman who was captured. I mean, she was driving a huge tractor trailer truck up there to carrying supplies to the troops and, and uh, was captured by the enemy and came through her captivity magnificently. And, uh, and so, you, you know, you got to be proud of the women in the service, just like I'm proud of the men in the service. I mean, they, they, their, their performance was terrific. If the changing role of women in this war won the general's unqualified approval, the changing role of television on the battlefield did not. He has serious questions about it. We are in an age of instant information. Um, I can think of several times when, when a report was going directly from the battlefield over national television directly to the enemy because of the nature of the world we live in today. And, and therefore, uh, fully recognizing First Amendment rights, fully recognizing the American public's right to know, there still needs to somehow be an examination of this phenomena and a determination of, of how, how do we, I don't want to use the word control, I don't want to use the word censorship, but how do we deal with this situation so that it doesn't cost the lives of, of American servicemen and women. That's, uh, and, and I think it's, I don't think we've adequately addressed it yet. I think it's something that needs to be talked about. Norman Schwarzkopf became a television personality himself during the war, largely because of his press briefings from Riyadh. General, not to take anything away from the Army and the Marines who made the breaching sir. maneuvers. I hope you don't. On this occasion, the reporter, asking about the real danger of minefields, unknowingly hit a nerve, a memory of Vietnam. There, a younger Schwarzkopf had crawled through an active minefield to save the life of a wounded soldier. You ever been in a minefield? No. Because all there's got to be is one mine, and that's intense. You risked your own life to save the life of one of your men. Mm -hmm. You were out of it, safe, and you went back in for this man. But I didn't have any choice. It, it was absolute, I had absolutely no choice at all. I was the battalion commander. It was my battalion, and 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 I, I now you know you talk about guilt and not being able to live with yourself. If I hadn't have done that, I would not be able to live with myself. Valor is in the eye of the beholder. It's like beauty, uh, and it's it's people go out and they're doing their job. Someone else sees what they're doing and says, "My goodness, look how courageous that is." But, you know, the person that's doing it isn't thinking at the time, gee, I, 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 I'm now doing something. I was scared to death in that minefield. I, I was, but, but it had to be done. Today, the general continues doing what has to be done, but now as then, he feels the weight of command, even in victory. Uh, you know, still, there's still 129 uh, people lost their lives. There's still a, a, a lot of people that are losing their lives even today in careless accidents and that sort of thing, and, and uh, you don't like to see one of them. General, do you feel the guilt for every one of those no, guilt men isn't, or women? No, guilt or, isn't the word. The responsibility. So, yeah, the responsibility, sure. I mean, uh, we, had, we had a terrible accident happen the other day, and I, I don't want to go into the details uh, of the accident, but here the war was over and the parents of this young man probably breathed a great sigh of relief that the war is over and uh, my son's coming home and subsequently that young man was killed because of out and out and out uh, carelessness and negligence and and that's a human life and, and i can't help but feel terrible compassion for that family i mean it's almost worse than them having lost their son in battle that's why I say the job's not done. A lot of people are saying, gee, it's all over. And I say, no, it's not over. It won't be over until every single one of the American servicemen and women we have over here is home safely. Then it'll be over. From ABC News, World News Saturday, here's Carol Simpson. Good evening. Declaring the Allied mission complete. 
The commander of Operation Desert Storm, General Norman Schwarzkopf, today left Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, his headquarters and home for the better part of a year. So many people are expected to greet Schwarzkopf when he gets back to Florida tomorrow morning that officials are asking the public to stay home and watch the event on television. ABC's Pierre Salinger has more on the general send-off from Saudi Arabia today. He has moved from war to history. The 56-year-old general about to retire with his brilliant leadership in the Gulf War has reached the 20th century heights of Generals George Marshall, Dwight Eisenhower, and Douglas MacArthur. Despite his joy at heading for home, he said he was sad to be leaving Saudi Arabia. I shall truly miss Saudi Arabia. I will truly miss the many, many friends that I have made here. At a ceremony in Saudi Arabia's defense ministry, General Schwarzkopf was given Saudi Arabia's top award, the first foreigner to receive it. In turn, he gave his colleague, Lieutenant General Khalid bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia, commander of the 130,000 Arab troops during the war, the American Legion of Merit, on behalf of President Bush. I have often said that if the world is to have a superpower, Thank God, it is the United States of America. When General Schwarzkopf was asked after the ceremony how he felt about Saddam Hussein still being in power, he didn't hide his feelings. I am disappointed at this time that that is the situation. General Schwarzkopf, now better known as Storm and Norman, had spent 257 days running operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, creating the exceptional military plan of going around the Iraqi troops. Tonight, he arrived in Cairo to thank the Egyptians for the role they played in the Gulf War. Tomorrow, he goes home to Tampa, Florida, back to his family, back to his nation that considers him a genuine hero. Pierre Salinger, ABC News. The commander who won the most lopsided victory in modern warfare came home today to his wife, three children, and the family dog. Okay, the event was low-key at the general's request. People were urged to stay home, but many came anyway. It's a great day to be a husband. It's a great day to be a father. It's a great day to be a brother. It's a great day to be a master of a great old dog. It's a great day to be a soldier, and it's a great day to be an American. Thank you very much. Forever the soldier's general, Schwarzkopf asked the crowd to remember the more than 200,000 U.S. troops still in the Persian Gulf. He's a leader. When he speaks, you listen to him. I think he's five-star material, <laughs> and I'll sign any petition for that one. <laughs> As a military band played the national anthem, Schwarzkopf struggled to hold back tears. He may be a four-star general, but like any soldier, he was glad to be home. Linda Patillo, ABC News, Tampa. The war began with bursts of light in the skies over Baghdad. It ended with white flags in the desert and jubilant soldiers completing their mission. But as they come home now to family and loved ones, their celebrations will be muted by the memory of those among them who fell in battle. Nothing except a battle lost, wrote the Duke of Wellington, can be half so melancholy as a battle won. Fire. 120 American men and women lost their lives in the service of the battle won. Army Sergeant Ronald Randazzo was killed when his tank was hit by Iraqi artillery fire. He was 24, the average age of all those killed in action. Sergeant Randazzo wrote a letter to a friend shortly before he died. I'm not really that afraid anymore. I'm worried about the people under me, he said. Pennsylvania suffered 14 dead, the most lost in combat of any one state. 
Army Specialist Christine Mays of Rochester Mills, Pennsylvania, was one of five women killed in action. Specialist Mays was killed along with 27 others when her barracks in Saudi Arabia was hit by a Scud missile. Specialist Mays left her engagement ring at home for fear of losing it in the war. The Army lost the most of any of the services, 97 killed in action. Army Sergeant Brian Scott was one of at least 49 of those killed who were married. Sergeant Scott was killed on February 26th by an Iraqi landmine. His son Casey Patrick was born two days earlier. Sergeant Scott never knew. One Navy pilot, three Air Force pilots, and 19 Marines were killed in action. Marine Lance Corporal Dion Stevenson of Bountiful, Utah was killed by friendly fire when his light armored vehicle was mistakenly attacked during the battle for the town of Kafji, Saudi Arabia. At the funeral for his 22-year-old son, Corporal Stevenson's father said, anything can happen in combat. Private Robert Talley was only 18, the youngest American to die. Private Talley of Newark, New Jersey, joined the army to further his education. He was one of 16 blacks killed in action. He was also one of 10 Americans killed by friendly fire. Not one drop of oil, his grandmother allowed, is worth the blood my grandson shed. Army Warrant Officer John Morgan sent a letter home to Bellevue, Washington to be opened in the event of his death. Warrant Officer Morgan's Black Hawk helicopter was shot down over Iraq on February 27th. His mother read the letter on March 3rd. Just know I have something. I know something. You don't what heaven is like. And 20-year-old Army Private Adrian Mitchell of Moreno Valley, California. Private Mitchell also died when her barracks was hit by the Scud missile. Her father, a retired Air Force sergeant, said, I did 30 years, 21 days, and I didn't get a scratch. My daughter's been in for five months, and she's dead. In peace, wrote the Greek philosopher Herodotus, children bury their fathers. In war, fathers bury their children.